very much for attending this morning's presentation. We've been doing it for the last two days, starting with Christchurch, Wellington, Auckland, and now Hamilton. Um, it's a program that Council has inaugurated to try to reach out and engage with our shareholders because the business that we're in is a new business in a new industry. And there's a lot of misconception and, and misunderstanding of what we do and what the whole macro environment is doing. So the whole purpose of Mark and Nick is, is to try to articulate our views of how we see the whole industry is going and, and to give you a classic background on where the company is. I mean, I used the line over the last two days of a journey for over a thousand miles or even 10,000 miles start with the first step. And of course, Kennesaw has done more than one step. We probably have 20 or 30 steps ahead of everyone else. But there's something different about coming back to Hamilton because this is where the company is based in the fair city of Hamilton. Julius Caesar conquered the world, conquered Europe, and created the great Roman Empire. But there's only one city that he would always go back to to celebrate his victories and with the people of Rome, and that is Rome. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce your local boy Mark and your local boy Nick. And they are here back in your hometown to tell you all about how well Kennesaw has been doing. Mark? Thanks, Sonny. Um, and thanks, everybody, for taking the time to come and see us today. It's, it is, as Tony said, it's a real pleasure to be able to share this journey with um, our shareholders and certainly with, um, there's a lot of our team members here today as well, um, but in our, in our hometown of Hamilton. So just to start off with, we've just got a very brief um, video um, which highlights um, some of our, or just, it's, a, it's a video representation of what Canna South is doing and where we're at. Sorry, Tony, missed your slide. <laughs>
So they say a, a picture paints a thousand words, and I think that video, every time I show it, it really, or we show it, it really sort of uh, it highlights a lot of things that we're doing and definitely paints a bit of a picture. Um, so I, I'd start off uh, with this particular slide because there, a lot of people can see something like Canna South and think it just appeared from nowhere. But the reality is that the um, seeds were literally planted as way back as 2002. So some images here show, um, so Nick in the hemp field and myself with my daughter, um, we, Nick applied for one of the first industrial hemp licenses in the country back in 2002 and we've always believed in natural products. Um, at that time it was a fibre story, so we were growing the fibre uh, for research that we were doing. Um, again, Nick um, instigated some funding uh, for a couple of PhD studies and a master's study um, looking at using hemp fibre and uh, composite materials. So ultimately we didn't move ahead with that, but we were in the hemp textile business. So, um, you know, we've been in this space for a long, long time. And um, through the years, um, Nick identified at a certain point that CBD had a lot of um, medicinal value. And, that, and I guess I was similar to a lot of people, and Nick probably was as well, in that uh, we probably thought medicinal cannabis was just a bit of a Trojan horse. It was people just using it to get high or maybe feel a little bit better if they're suffering from cancer and going through chemotherapy. We didn't really understand that medicinal cannabis was in fact a, a real thing. Um, then when you started to see this thing CBD emerging and you looked at the anti-spasmodic and anti-seizure uh, properties of it, you thought this is actually quite remarkable and so there's a lot more to it. So, um, you know, we started to look a little bit further and head in that direction. But really without these early um, building blocks, we would not have been in a position to sort of um, move into this direction. Um, and these hemp trials were in the Waikato here, some of the best growing land for industrial hemp. Um, I think some of the height, what were some of the heights you got to, Nick? 14, 15 feet. You know, it was amazing. It grows a foot a foot a week. So grown, yeah, grown for fibre, so not what we're doing today, but certainly it just shows how uh, valuable the Waikato area is for the subject. Oh, yep. Thank you. So, um, so when we did decide to pivot towards um, medicinal cannabis, um, at that point, you know, it was very, very difficult to operate in this area. Um, the only way you could operate is with research licences. And so having relationships with the University of Waikato um, enabled us to start pushing in that direction. So, um, you know, through that process, we facilitated um, controlled drug licences for the university. Um, some funding for a master's study to extract um, CBD or cannabinoids from industrial hemp um, and also some funding for what we believe was the first supercritical fluid extraction of uh, cannabinoids from industrial hemp which was also undertaken by Callaghan um, Innovation. So these were sort of significant milestones and they really set us on the way but one with dealing with funding which is very important when you're doing research to help you, you know, um, fund those activities, um, but also just navigating the regulatory pathway and this is going to be definitely one of the most regulated spaces in the country, so really uh, valuable steps in the journey. Um, I'd like to just touch on the licences, there's a lot of misconceptions um, in, you know, about medicinal cannabis and what licences are and aren't available at the moment. So the only licences companies like ours can have are for research and scientific purposes. So there's no commercial production um, allowed under those licenses. It has to be for, you know, we're not able to produce medicines and give them to patients. We're able to just work in a scientific framework. So all of the licenses relate to the scientific activities that you're currently undertaking. So, um, you know, there's a bit of publicity about the uh, cultivator prohibited plant licenses that different companies are getting, and those are really important licenses. But the license up the top is the one that we feel is actually probably the, the, the most important part for our development. That's a license to deal in controlled drugs. So what that, um, and, and specifically um, cannabinoids, and what that allows us to do is actually operate a um, research laboratory. You can see an image there of Dan um, working in the lab. So it's one thing to grow the plant that's, you know, complex, but only relatively complex. Um, certainly being able to actually extract and refine the cannabinoids, um, you're starting to get into much more complex areas. 
So in our current laboratory, we've got some of the most advanced extraction and refinement equipment that there is available in the sector, and that enables, enables us to actually um, access some of the, and purify the pharmaceutical quality, some of the compounds that we find in the plant. Now that's really important because if you're undertaking scientific research um, and moving into drug discovery, you really need to have um, repeatable pharmaceutical quality compounds. So very, very important. Um, import license, we uh, successfully imported some dried cannabis flour early on before our own cultivation facility was operational. Again, this is very difficult to do. You're importing dried cannabis from, you know, um, many airlines won't handle it. You know, this is still a very, very new area. So that was actually a significant achievement. Um, following on from that, um, also achieving licenses to bring in our first four cannabis cultivars or cannabis varieties bred specifically for cannabinoid production as opposed to industrial hemp. So that's easy to say but it's harder to do. New Zealand has very, very strict biosecurity and phytosanitary certification requirements when you import seed. Um, so there's many industrial hemp varieties that meet those standards, but cannabis seeds and cannabis breeders are largely still in the, in the black market or in the grey market. So it's very hard to find breeders out there that are able to actually do that. So through that process, we signed an MOU with one of Europe's leading cannabis genetic breeders, um, and we successfully managed to get phytosanitary certification to bring our first varieties in. So that was qu quite a milestone for us and it enabled us to get on with our cultivation, which was really great. So what is medicinal cannabis? I like to touch on this every time because this is obviously at the heart of the matter. It's one thing to look at the economic opportunities, but it's also a complex area and it covers a whole spectrum. So at one end, you've got pharmaceutically approved medicines such as Sativex gone through clinical trials and have been approved for specific conditions. And ultimately, that's the future of medicinal cannabis getting right through to that end of the scale. Um, at the other end, you've got, uh, you can see CBD infused water here. You're going into the health and wellness sectors um, and it covers everything in between. So within that spectrum, you'll find uh, people smoking cannabis for therapeutic or medicinal value um, or extracting and making simple oils at home or green fairies doing that. And so it, it definitely covers that full spectrum. Um, in New Zealand, what's being proposed is a pharmaceutical quality model, which means that medicines will need to be produced to a medicine standard. Um, they won't necessarily need to go through clinical trials, although that's ultimately where um, you want to be taking your medicines as you develop them. So that's going to enable you know, quality standards so that um, when you walk into a pharmacy and collect your prescription, you know, what it says on the, on the medicine label is what will actually be in there. It will be a very high quality. So that's an important distinction with New Zealand, whereas in other jurisdictions, a lot of these other, especially CBD infused waters and things like that are actually unregulated. So you know, um, some people don't think it should be a pharmaceutical model, but you know, we, we tend to think it's gonna protect patients and also ultimately um, protect the integrity of these products as they're further developed. So you know, how does it all work? So this is the really complex area. I'm certainly not a scientist, so I get up here and sort of talk to these slides as best I can. But essentially, um, what underpins it all is what we call the endocannabinoid system, which is a series um, of receptors within us that help regulate a whole bunch of um, subsystems within us. Um, it's a very important um, discovery that's you know, only relatively recently been made, and we're certainly learning more and more about it. So it just so happens that um, all mammals produce cannabinoids ourselves. Um, they're called endocannabinoids. And so these, um, these compounds bind with certain receptors that we find um, within our bodies. And just so happens that the cannabis plant happens to produce um, very similar compounds called phytocannabinoids. Um, so often they bind to the same receptors. And so if some of these subsystems are out of balance, sometimes introducing um, these compounds will mean that that system um, can re rebalance itself. So again, we're at the very early days of discovering exactly the full potential um, of this um, area. Um, and, and probably, you know, the fact that the cannabis plant produces these compounds is interesting. The, f the, the actual system itself is probably much more interesting and in where the science is going to show that, that these various subsystems go. I often describe it, you, you've thought you've been living in a two-story house and you've found that there's a whole other story in the house, you know, and it's actually maybe the best floor of the house as well, so it's very important anyway. So um, I touch on here a couple of the main compounds. People are very familiar with THC. That's the compound that actually produces the high. 
Um, people are also quite familiar these days with CBD, um, a non psycho well it does produce very, very slight psychoactive activity, but it's not what you would describe as being a high. Um, CBD is showing um, you know, efficacy, anxiety, sleep disorders, chronic pain and inflammation, um, THC, treatment of nausea, spasms, um, appetite. Um, there's, a, there's a whole range of different things that these compounds um, work within. Um, and behind that, there's over 100 compounds within the plant. They're discovering more all the time. Um, and a lot of these are showing um, uh, efficacy in different areas as we start to isolate them. Um, but CBD and THC is certainly the most prevalent within the plant. So Kennesouth is a science-led company. We're very interested in getting um, and getting to these other cannabinoids. Um, another thing that you'll hear quite often in the subject is what they call the entourage effect, which is where um, if you isolate one compound, a theory is that it doesn't work as well um, if not surrounded by other compounds. So that um, is very interesting, but it does present some problems in a pharmaceutical model. In a pharmaceutical model, you need to produce repeatability. A medicine needs to be the same every time. And certainly if you're wanting to produce clinical data, you need to have a medicine that is the same every time so that you can actually measure the results. So it is possible to achieve an entourage effect in a pharmaceutical model, but it requires a bit of science. And essentially that's um, isolating these various compounds, um, purifying them to a pharmaceutical level, and then putting them back together. So, you know, full plant extracts are, are great and there's a place for them as well, but in full um, pharmaceutical grade medicines, you really need to start getting into this advanced end of the science, which is what Canisouth is, is focused on. So uh, this slide here, I've recently come back from the US. Um, this, this picture on the right is in um, Oregon, which is sort of the epicenter for CBD production in the USA at the moment. Um, and it's quite remarkable to see what's going on over there. Um, field grown, this is um, industrial hemp, although it's not the industrial hemp of old. This has been bred specifically for cannabinoid production. CBD and other non-psychoactives are starting to become um, more and more prevalent. Um, we think that this is probably the future of growing for non-psychoactives because you're able to harness the power of the sun, you're able to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, for a country like New Zealand, you're also able to play into the providence of the country. If you're growing in a warehouse or a factory in the middle of a city, it's hard to argue that you, know, you have real providence there. When you're growing outdoors in the clean green um, environment, you know, you've got a bit more of a story. And it certainly reduces the cost of these non-psychoactive cannabinoids. You still need to refine them further, which is where the science and IP kicks in. But um, ultimately, it's a very interesting story. And you know, some of the growth areas, uh, all the focus on medicinal cannabis or a lot of the attention comes because of THC. People can use it to get high. But the reality is that um, you know, this non-psychoactive non area or the interest in cannabinoids that don't actually produce a high is becoming bigger and bigger and in all likelihood will overtake the use of THC, um, you know, in the market everywhere. So, you know, some of the key areas for the development of medicinal cannabis. So a regulated medicinal cannabis market, that's what we're about to see here in New Zealand. Um, this will offer patients consistency of therapeutic effect. If you're suffering from epilepsy or a specific condition, you want to be able to make sure that the medicine you take is the same every time. You know, part of the problem that we've had um, at the moment is that people are accessing these products on the black market. There's very little consistency. I saw an article recently from the ESR where they're testing different compounds and they're finding somebody's bought what they thought was a CBD product. In fact, some, it's mainly THC or vice versa. You know, so this is a risk for patients. There's contaminants in there, pesticides potentially. Um, you know, there's just absolutely no control of knowing what people are actually getting. Um, next generation medicines. So t I touched on isolating these compounds. Um, product formulations, um, research that enables you to actually get these compounds and then start to unlock some more complex conditions or areas where we're finding medicinal cannabis is showing some efficacy, but there's still room for improvement. <laughs> And so by being able to build specific medicines, you're able to target um, those conditions. And that's where the IP lies as well. And ultimately, um, a lot of the products that we're seeing in the marketplace at the moment, if you look internationally, are very simple formulations of THC and CBD and a carrier oil and a tincture. They're actually quite primitive medicines. 
And so there's a, there's, a, there's a huge area for development there, but it really requires being at the high end of the science, which is what Canna South is all about. So everything we've invested in up until now, our science approach is all geared at getting to that next generation. If we just chase first generation medicines, it's a race to the bottom. So we really need to be focusing on, um, and we will produce these first generation medicines in all likelihood, but we need to be thinking three, five, 10 years ahead and really moving in that direction. Um, so the product categories in New Zealand, again, we're going for a pharmaceutical quality model. So a doctor will write a prescription, you'll go to the pharmacy, the pharmacist will fill it. So medicines will in all likelihood look like what you would normally see out of a pharmacy. So tinctures, again, quite primitive, soft gels, topical creams, transdermal patches, tablets, nasal or oral sprays, nebulizer inhalers, um, you know, there, and there will be further you know, options as we move forward. Um, you know, for development, definitely cannabis breeding, cannabis cultivars. It's one thing to isolate these or identify these individual compounds, um, but often they're not present in very high um, quantities in the individual plants. So by the time you extract them and refine them, they don't make um, commercial um, sense. And so it's a matter of starting to breed those varieties to start targeting those specific um, cannabinoids. Um, growing techniques, it's all about everything New Zealand does well, especially in the horticultural and agricultural sector, is what we really need to focus on with the raw production, which is, which is streamlining, doing it better, you know, and that's, that's what we're definitely focused on. And, you know, often, especially in Oregon, you know, a lot of the processing is still quite primitive. They're being hand harvested, hand hung. It certainly haven't moved into a proper industrialised, you know, approach, efficient approach. So, you know, there's lots of room for development there. So what's happening in New Zealand? So there's you know, a lot of confusion here as well. A lot of people think, oh, the referendum, medicinal cannabis, is, is it even going to pass? You know, they think it's somehow caught up in that particular um, debate. Um, it's not. The law has been passed. Um, it was passed in December 18, and there was a requirement for the regulations to be um, finalised by December this year, so the race is on. Um, in July, the Ministry of Health uh, released their draft regulations for public consultation. Um, and they've done a very good job in what is a very, very complex subject. You know, there's a few concerns um, within the, what, you know, what's being proposed. I think um, our biggest concern is prescriber education. We still haven't seen a clear um, signalling from the Ministry of how they're going to deal with that particular issue, because ultimately if prescribers are not um, informed, they're not likely to write prescriptions and that's going to limit access for patients to these medicines and it's also going to limit the, the economic opportunity as well for a company like Kenner South. But the reality is that if we look at what's going on overseas, um, as different prescribers become more educated in these products, they start to write more prescriptions, they start to see the results. Patients organise themselves these days and will start to become aware of what doctors are educated and you start to get a momentum building. But we do say we're preparing for a marathon and not a sprint and you'll see that in the way that we're structuring our business affairs to make sure that we can scale rapidly but not get ahead of ourselves as well. And so there's definitely a big opportunity but we need to pace ourselves. So in December the regulations should be um, finalised and we'll know, you know, we'll have a good look at, you know, what's going on then and then Q1 next year the scheme rolls out and companies like Canna South will start applying for licences. So another concern is that the Ministry is under-resourced to be able to deal with what could be a large number of applications. There are quite a few different licence types as well. Um, Cultivation is going to be the big area where I think a lot of people are going to want to be involved. Um, possibly slightly less as you get into manufacture medicines because that's a very, very complex area of the value chain. But it, look, if they're not resourced to deal with this, it, you know, it could take time. So we have to be prepared for that as well. So the scheme itself, so a licensing regime, I've touched on that just a little bit. Um, you know, essentially that's, that will cover the broad range of activities within the space. Um, an agency that will oversee the whole scheme and how it's rolled out and its efficiency and what's actually happening and then the quality standards, which are the important part, which is how these um, medicines are you know, meant to be created, the cultivation standards. So the Ministry um, has been very proactive in dealing with industry. We're a founding member of the New Zealand Medical Cannabis Council, which means that we're um, 
actively involved with dealing with the ministry. We're down there once a month talking to them about, you know, and they are interested in our feedback. You know, they've indicated quite clearly that they want to allow an export opportunity for companies in this space in New Zealand. And so that's important because New Zealand ultimately only has roughly 5 million people. So we need to access those export markets. And so the ministry, as I say, have indicated that, you know, they're keen to have the regulations drafted in such a way that allows us access to those markets. So, you know, we're quietly optimistic, as I say, notwithstanding some funding issues potentially at the ministry and, um, you know, this prescriber education um, issue. So countries where, you know, medicinal cannabis uh, is available or the laws have been changing, if we look at this map again in six months, it would have changed probably quite dramatically. There's a fundamental change going on around the world. And, you know, look, you'll hear an argument you know, oh, there's, there's no clinical data or it's, you know, it's just all anecdotal evidence. The reality is medicinal cannabis has been available in good portions of the US and in growing areas for a long time, but it's still federally illegal. So what that's meant is that it's very difficult to actually do legitimate research in the US. Um, and it also means that the products that are, are available um, vary from place to place and it's very difficult to get clinical data out of that sort of um, regime. You know, Having said that, there is a lot of clinical data actually out there. There's more than, than people think. And part of um, a prescriber education program is actually pulling that data together and consolidating it so that physicians and um, prescribers can actually find you know, that information more easily. So, you know, rapidly changing landscape and um, you know, it's really quite exciting to be involved in it. Now the size of the opportunity, so you know, of course, um, as shareholders, you'll be interested in what the size of the potential market is. Um, Deloitte recently uh, did a study looking at the Canadian market and, and in Canada um, you do have a legal recreational market but they estimated that the size of the Canadian medical market, they did an estimate on that. Now that's what that indicates is uh, because that's quite an advanced uh, medical market even if the products aren't that advanced, it, it, what it indicates to us is really an inherent underlying demand for these products. So if you take the figure that they produced and you, you look at the population of New Zealand and convert it into New Zealand dollars, you're looking at a market size of say 200 odd million dollars. So as I say, the caveat there is that that's the underlying demand potentially. Um, prescriber numbers were going to mean that the market is going to start much, much smaller than that and take time to build to that sort of level. But then this is still working with first generation medicine. So by the time next generation medicines come, you know, you've got a whole other wave of, of demand that will start to build. And also um, CBD in its own right is only just getting going. It's really becoming more and more popular as people are starting to understand it. So in the US, there's, you know, there's various reports uh, on the size of the CBD market. And you know, some reports you see 20 billion US dollars by 2020, 2022, 2024. Um, you know, in most of the US, CBD is unregulated, so it's very difficult to actually measure the size of that market. But it is, it's a rapidly growing market. Um, the lack of regulation does present problems in that particular area because there's no consistency of quality and there's a, there's a danger if people are buying a CBD infused water with very little to no CBD in there or the CBD is not in there at all, um, they lose faith with what it's all about. So in New Zealand that's not the approach that's being undertaken, we're going to have a regulated market. CBD is a medicine under the Medicines Act, so doctors can prescribe that right now. Um, there is some talk of looking at moving it from a, a prescription level to say pharmacy or pharmacist only. Um, we do have medicines that you can buy at the supermarket, paracetamol, ibuprofen, etc. So, you know, we believe over time these non-psychoactive cannabinoids, as they're better understood, will start to move down from being controlled drugs and starting to move into say an over-the-counter type situation. But as I say, quality standards aren't such a bad thing. They do protect the, the consumer and ultimately the, the integrity of the product. So yeah, the complex value chain, I do like to talk about this as well because people often think, right, I'm going into medicinal cannabis, I'm going to get a license to grow some medicinal cannabis, I'm going to extract an oil, hey presto, I'm in the medicinal cannabis business. Um, yes, potentially you can be a cultivator or you could do simple, ex well, simple you could do extractions, um, but the, the value chain itself is much, much more complex than that. Um, so from cultivation, you can have broad acre cultivation, such as I you know, showed a slide there, but then you can go right through to pharmaceutical quality, GMP-esque type situations in you know, very, very highly controlled environments. Um, 
Cultivating high THC varieties are going to be heavily regulated, security, proper persons, protocols, you know, there's a lot. It's a massive undertaking to actually get yourself operational in that space. So lots of people are going to be interested. I think for high THC it's going to be very difficult for many companies to actually um, do it um, effectively. Um, extraction, so you've got first phase extraction, so there are opportunities there around the country to do, um, basically do the first supercritical fluid or ethanol extractions, um, but that's complex in its own right. These are um, complex pieces of equipment. It, it amazes me as we travel around to various um, trade shows and look at different types of equipment. There's a, there's a saying that they all roll out, oh this is a turnkey solution. Oh you buy this machine and it's turnkey, you'll be up and running. Um, but it's like if I handed you a violin and said this is a turnkey violin. So maybe we can teach you, you know, one tune or song or, but, you know, where do you go from there? So that's why we've invested heavily in developing our own methods and expertise and understanding of running these equipment. We can't just turn the key and run a lab, you know, I, I would call it at that point death by consultant, you know, because they'll be coming back to continue to try and educate you on how you're running your machinery. So API production, which is essentially producing the pharmaceutical ingredient, um, you know, that in its own right is, a, is a complex, so you're getting it to a pharmaceutical quality that's meeting GMP standards. Now GMP is what's being proposed here in New Zealand, so I touched on it before, so that's manufacture medicine. So you can say GMP really easily, but if you start to actually investigate how difficult it is to build a GMP plant, validate all your processes, how long that's going to take and produce something to medicine standards. Now that's a really big barrier to entry. It's also a big opportunity if you're able to be organised enough to get into that space and that's where Canacel's going. Um, formulation, now this is a key. Um, if you can design better medicines that are more effective um, for the patient, um, that's, that's where you want to be. Now formulation's complex. Um, to do that, it's easy to say, very hard to do, but it's a minefield as well. You've got patents, you've got freedom to operate, you've got clinical trials, randomised controlled trials, you know, it's a very, very complex area of the business. Um, so at Canis South, again, we're focused on the science, on building a team that's capable of moving through these pathways and actually achieve um, results. So uh, medicine manufacture, again, you know, very complex. Um, medicine wholesaling, support services. There's a lot of auxiliary businesses that will support other you know, groups within the region, um, within the sector, software development. It just, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a big economic opportunity for support services in the space. So Canis South, yes, we successfully listed on the NZX. So that was um, an exciting day for us, but really just the signal, the beginning really of the journey. Um, you know, that's a massive body of work in its own right. Um, to be to offer a regulated or to be in that regulated environment again not every company is going to be able to do that um, we're going into one of the most regulated sectors in the in the in the country and so it didn't frighten us we want to operate to the highest levels we want our governance structures to be at the very highest levels we want New Zealanders to have a chance to invest in the sector through a regulated offer um, you know you've got options when you're raising capital private um, crowdfunding you know we believed um, that New Zealanders did want to invest in the sector and I think we're starting to see that um, and you know being listed and being um, you know our shares are tradable so it offers shareholders liquidity so they can choose to support us or not so um, and we're confident with that because we knew that once we, we achieve that milestone we need to get on with building the business and hitting milestones and that's that's exactly what we're focused on. So milestones just touched on that so this is obviously critical um, one of the first milestones that we announced was successfully gaining uh, Callaghan funding for some of our vital research. Um, so again, if we're looking three, five years down the track, we'd better start you know, thinking about um, you know, what, what these products are going to look like in the future. And so having the support from Callaghan funding, you know, that's not an easy process to go through either. Um, essentially, you're being peer reviewed, they're looking at your research programs, are they commercially viable, what is the potential outcome for this? Um, is this in, in New Zealand's interest to invest in? Because ultimately this is the government's money that is going into some of these funding projects. So drug um, discovery, looking at neuropathic pain initially, but really this is just a foundation study for drug discovery for Canis South. It's just the beginning. 
Um, and then drug delivery, which is um, not couriers and Uber Eats of cannabis, it's actually how we deliver the cannabinoids into, you know, into the human or the animal in that case. And that's an important thing to touch on too. This is not just a human story, this is veterinary as well, and we're very interested in that sector. Um, so, you know, and I'll just touch on here, it really goes back to the last slide, you know, a lot of people think, well, why would Canna South list at such an early stage? Well, the reality is this industry is coming. We can see it happening around the world. And you either get your skates on and get yourself ready to go. If you sit and wait until such time as the industry's here, well, you've missed the boat. So, you know, we, we identified that if we were going to be a player in this industry and actually be, um, you know, um, a viable entity, we need to get on and get on with it quickly. Because like all industries, especially new and exciting industries, um, there's going to be the normal you know, flow of um, capital coming in, some companies getting going, and ultimately there will be consolidation. And so Canna South needs to be a leader in the space, and that's what we intend to do. So Canna South Cultivation. So this was quite an exciting um, milestone for us. Um, as you break down the value chain, you realise how complex it is. Now cultivation has an area where it can easily be um, commoditised. Um, and it in all likely will do because you'll have a lot of people that are interested in that area. So, you know, there's a lot of capital that you can also need to tie up into that space and also just the time and effort that needs to go into it. You need to be really focused on it and make sure that you can do it really well. And you ultimately, like all horticultural or agricultural products, you need to be producing the highest quality at the lowest price point. So our JV partner, um, Aaron Craig and his family interests. Aaron's been very successful in building businesses in the past. He builds relationship businesses. And Canna South Cultivation um, will, will have its own facilities and do its own cultivation, but ultimately, if we're able to tack, tackle the um, export market, we need a growers network. And so um, he'll be tasked with getting out there, finding the best growers and building a robust network. But as a company, it's very important for us, especially in these early stages, to make sure that we've got control over our supply chain. We need reliable, high quality material because you can't make medicines if you can't rely on your production partners. So we really had no option but to make sure we had a serious stake in the cultivation side of the business. And so, um, you know, we believe this enables us to do that. Um, our first harvest. So, um, you know, it was a significant milestone. It was, you know, one of the first harvests of high THC cannabis material legal um, in New Zealand. Um, and as it really does signify a turning point for the industry here in New Zealand because it's, 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 it's a sign that things are moving along. And for us it provides valuable um, you know, material to go into our research programs. It enables our um, research laboratories to function um, at full speed. Um, we're not hindered by having to import um, you know, expensive or difficult um, import processes with bringing flour in. Um, so yeah, really exciting. Um, obviously having those cultivars available in our production facility means we've got those available to transfer through to a commercial um, operation and so really try and get going as fast as possible once we, um, once we get that underway. So shareholder growth, so this is really exciting. As I say, we're, you know, we're super excited to um, you know, allow New Zealanders a chance to get involved in this sector. Um, again, I think it's, it's, um, it's we're seeing a new type of investor coming along that's just interested in investing in companies that they believe in the outcome of the product rather than just necessarily looking at financial returns. Of course, as investors, you're always looking for financial returns, but um, you know, we can see that we, we announced recently um, that we had hit over 2,000 shareholders. Well, we've recently learned that um, our friends at Sharesies show up as one uh, shareholder on our, on our um, shareholder database, where in fact there's, you know, over, well, we talked to them yesterday, 5,500 on, you know, in their investment pool that are currently involved in Canisell. So that means we've got well over 7,000 investors. So, you know, that is fantastic. And these people are um, energised, they're um, excited about what we're doing. So we're thrilled to actually be able to share the journey with um, shareholders. We want to operate a company that is um, open, approachable, transparent, and we want to share the information as much as possible. So we'll be, we'll be looking to do these as often as possible. We encourage our shareholders to get in touch. If you've got questions, get in touch with us. We are approachable. It's a complex area and there's, there's a lot to learn. So, you know, we've been super excited to have all those investors on. We obviously had a few bumps in the road shortly after listing, but it's nice to have moved forward into positive territory. But as a company, we've always been focused on just doing the business, hitting our milestones, and, you know, hopefully the rest will take care of itself. 
So again, this is a really big one. So Midwest Pharmaceutics, um, as a company, you know, we have to decide how we're going to manufacture our medicines. Well, there are no contract manufacturers around at the moment that can produce these medicines for us. They don't exist. So we can wait for one to come along and we can then, um, you know, have to, you know, work, work with them and share our IP. Uh, we can build our own facility and, and others in the space might, might, you know, consider that and probably are doing that. Um, that process is complex, you know, GMP, manufacture medicines, you know, these are systems you have to verify and validate every step in the process. It takes a long time and it's expensive. Um, what we get with Midwest Pharmaceutics is a company that is already GMP certified. Um, there's still work to do there, but you've got a culture in place that is already operating in that GMP space. They have um, existing revenues. They're producing supplements and other products. And, you know, we believe in the future that many of these non-psychoactive cannabinoids will move down into the supplements and wellness space. And so to have a, a bit of a stake in that area is, is very important. It means that as we develop our medicines and processes, the IP that we put into that facility ultimately belongs to us, which is very exciting. Um, not only that, we get another key partner. You know, people precede all business, and so Canisalf is all about building the, the, the best team that we can, and, and we're really, you know, moving a long way towards doing that. So Mark Belchin, who comes on board, he's a GMP expert. Um, he currently owns Midwest. We've bought 60% of it. We've got the option to acquire the other 40% over the next five years. And so Mark comes on board as our chief manufacturing officer. So we get somebody who's invested in Canisalf. Um, he has shares in Canna South, and so, um, you know, people with invested, invested interests, you know, that are passionate, excited, energised, you know, that's how we build a, 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 you know, a competitive business in this sector, and we get that with Mark. So this is an incredibly exciting development for us. So that leads on to what does the group structure look like? So you can see um, Canna South up the top there, you know, that's the listed entity. Below that is Canisalf Plant Research, that's the company that does the trading, that does the researching, that will formulate and design the, the medicines, that will brand the medicines, that will sell the products. So that's where ultimately um, all of the brand IP lies. Um, Canisalf Cultivation, so that's our sourcing arm. So they're tasked with producing all of our raw product. They have the first right of refusal to produce everything that we need. If they can't produce it, they have the option to go and find that material. If they can't find that material, we have the option to go and source it ourselves. So we've got, again, another motivated partner there. We've got significant control over that supply chain so that we can make sure we get what we need when we need it. Now that's important because the growth cycle, if you're growing outdoors, it's seasonal. Um, if we've identi identified specific cannabinoids that we're interested in um, and we, get, we have a breeding program that, that or we acquire genetics that give us access to those cannabinoids in commercial, commercially viable quantities, then we need a partner that's able to actually cultivate them and produce them for us. So um, these things take time and so we're, we're really pleased to have um, that, that underway now. So I touched on Midwest Pharmaceutics. So again, you know, we believe now we have the whole seed to sale um, building blocks of the business. So um, we can get on with actually doing the business now. And so that's what we're focused on. The next six, eight, 12 months, two years, you know, we'll really start to, um, you know, be able to work with these building blocks. So it finalizes a lot of, um, you know, what we need to do to, to get from seed to sale. Now, there are other areas that we may add on to this as time goes by. There are other opportunities for us to consider, but for now we have a solid building block and we've got, you know, a lot. We also feel that the way that we've approached this, we've conserved as much capital as possible, and that's important um, because it's a long journey that we're uh, moving on um, and, you know, it does have, um, you know, it can consume a lot of capital, so it's important to plan your strategy carefully. The future for Canna South, so I've touched on it a little bit already. Obviously product initiatives are important. What are you gonna sell? You better sell something. So, um, you know, we're working on product formulations at the moment and we'll be, you know, able to announce um, in due course what our first products will look like. Um, just to, again, understand a little bit about GMP um, and especially the timeline for licensing. If, if licenses are, are available early next year, we don't know how long the ministry is going to take to process those licenses. Could take them two weeks, could take them four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, we don't know. Um, once you get your license, then you start your growing, your first grow, um, you produce your first material, you need to start sending that material through the manufacturing pathway. Each step 
risks of that pathway in a medicines um, environment needs to be validated. That takes a long time, so if you actually break down the supply chain, it will take a very long time for New Zealand Providence material to start coming through the pipeline. So as a company, we need to look at other um, opportunities, such as um, you know, bringing in white label products to our formulations uh, from overseas. That enables you to get a product on the market sooner. Um, bringing in active ingredients and then formulating them here in New Zealand. Again, Midwe Midwest gives us some opportunities there, but there is work to do there as well. So, you know, there's, there's a staged approach that you can, that you can um, look at to getting your products to market, and we're certainly investigating that. Each of these different approaches will have different margins and they'll have different considerations and, you know, your product formulations. So there's a lot to do there as well, but we are certainly um, working in that area and conscious. You know, uh, Nick and I come from um, businesses of selling stuff, making a profit, and ultimately this is what this business needs to be about, actually producing products and selling them. So in the supply chain, we do have options for um, other revenue streams as well. Canna South Cultivation in its own right is able to produce flour and sell it, um, export or to other um, customers if Canna South doesn't need it. Um, we've got the option of looking at toll production, which is where we do contract manufacturers for other in the, others in the industry as they start to um, develop uh, with Midwest. You know, you have to consider all these options because revenue is going to be very important. So, you know, but we do have options now, which is quite exciting. So, yeah, this is a big one. As I say, it's a, it's, it's a challenge, prescriber education. So, um, you know, we are talking with others in the industry and the ministry about this particular issue, but we are certainly working on our own prescriber education um, and patient education as well. And education in general is, is, you know, critical in this space. The thing with the education is that, you know, it needs to be at arm's length. You know, if, uh, physicians, you know, are going to trust education. They need to be able to... Um, it's not just from a, you know, a drug company. And so, you know, working with universities and subject matter experts that can actually um, provide proper education um, programs that doctors and uh, pharmacists can earn their points with, um, you know, that's what we're looking at, so that it's sort of arm's length, um, but really just, you know, seeking to educate. Um, and look, most doctors, what they're really interested in knowing is, it's as simple as this, what conditions would I consider medicinal cannabis for if I was prescribing? Of those conditions, what type of medicinal cannabis would I consider? THC, CBD, a mix? Um, once I've established that, what is the starting dose? And how do I titrate up? And how do I titrate down? And then what are the drug interactions that I need to be aware of? And so, you know, it's not, that part is not that complex. It just needs to be put together in a, in a, um, in a proper way. And look, we've done GP conferences. GPs are, um, broadly speaking, open to the idea of medicinal cannabis. They just want to see the information. They want to have concise information that they can rely on. But as I say, there is, it will take a little time for prescribers to, you know, to get moving. So complete the construction of our cultivation facility. So Canna South intends to, um, and through our partners at Canna South Cultivation, intends to operate at the highest end of environmental sustainability with our raw production. Uh, there are, um, Obviously, many companies overseas producing cannabis, and many of them are producing them in industrial units, um, in the middle of cities, utilizing high energy costs. We believe in the power of the sun, um, but you know, you you also need to be producing high quality. So, um, so there's a balance there, and how you approach that is important. But certainly, looking at your environmental footprint, your carbon footprint, we think is critical. Your water usage. So everything we do will be focused on putting us at the very top end of um, environmental sustainability. So that's a big focus for us. But this is a big project in its own right, and having partners that are engaged in that and able to um, work through this process is really important. The site itself at Canna South Cultivation, it's, we're initially um, leasing a, a relatively small area of what is over a 100 acre block and prime growing land, um, but we have the ability to extend our footprint on that land at any time um, through our cultivation partner. So it really gives us um, access to a, 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 you know, a big area of land. We can, we're going for a phased approach, so it's making sure that um, our greenhouses are modular it means that we can add them. Our whole philosophy has been to design this business um, to operate at a very, very high level um, at a small size that's designed to scale rapidly so that we're not spending capital before it's required. Once you have the brains of the operation, the, the, um, you know, your head house and how everything is processed, to add other modules, um, if you've allowed for it, is relatively quick. And so that's um, an approach that we're looking at taking. 
Um, so flexibility, ultimate, ultimately producing um, product and being flexible. And as you develop the market, you know, being ready to scale, and that's what that's what we're intending to do. Um, organics is something we're very, very interested in. Organics, um, and again, building on New Zealand's provenance. We're, you know, we're called Canna South. People often ask, well, you're not in the south of New Zealand, but we're in the south of the world. So that sort of says a little bit about our aspirations. We intend to be a global company and, and representing New Zealand. We believe in brand New Zealand, and so we're certainly going to be pushing that. And so the providence, the story, how you create your products, we believe is critical in that, in that, in that journey. I talked a little bit about before about the growers network. So, you know, obviously if you are doing broad acre outdoor production, you need to spread your risk a little bit geographically. Also, there'll be cultivars that are better suited for different areas of the country. But if you have a big storm come through a subtropical low or, a, you know, a cyclone, um, you know, that can present a challenge and a problem. And so, um, but, you know, to go again to produce products that are going to go into a medicine standard, you need to have growers that you can trust that are going to do a good job. You need to support them with genetics, with growing processes. Um, so building a really robust growers network through relationships is really important. And so you know that's a big focus for Canna South cultivation. So Midwest Pharmaceutics, so we've got the building blocks there, we've got a GMP umbrella, um, we've got everything there that we need to start moving into this manufactured medicines um, space. It will require um, putting in specialist equipment um, and making some alterations there. And there's, there's plenty of opportunity to grow that business as well. So as I say, it comes with existing revenues, which means that um, it has a base of customers already. Um, but we can get on there now and focus on supporting that business. The methods and processes that we develop in our um, scientific laboratories and our formulation science, we can then transfer into that uh, facility as we move forward with our, with our products. So again, that's really exciting. So obviously, none of this is possible until you have the licenses to be able to operate in the sector. So, um, you know, we are well versed in uh, moving through the regulatory pathway having achieved multiple licenses over many years, dealing with the regulators. The same regulators that we've dealt with all the way through will be the same regulators that are going to be administering this particular system, the same auditors. So having a relationship and understanding what they're looking for I think is very important. There is going to be a bit of a logjam of people applying for these licenses. Um, we intend to have our applications concise, um, ready to go as soon as possible. And so. Um, you know, but that's obviously a key turning point. Once you gain your licenses, effectively you can get into the business. So ultimately, explore export opportunities. I touched on that before. We've only got five, five million people here, but you know, there's a big uh, market out there. We have companies approaching us wanting our products. Um, we don't have a supply chain yet, so we can't go out and sign fancy off-take agreements that guarantee X amount, $100 million worth of you know, um, exports. Um, you know, we build the supply chain and as we are confident that supply chain is able to deliver, we then, you know, start to instigate looking at some of these export opportunities and contracts. So, but that's obviously, you know, where we're going next. Um, and then, yeah, that's last, that's the end of the presentation, but I just, I, you know, I'd like to um, touch on again, you know, we're thrilled to be in this particular region. We think it's a perfect area of the country for this opportunity. We're close enough to the biggest, you know, city in the country. Um, you know, we're able to attract really high quality people to come and work with Canna South. We're getting approached by, um, you know, many different people that want to come and be involved. Um, people that are happy to relocate down into this area, which says something pretty special about this particular um, place. And so, as I say, it's all about the people and we intend to, you know, operate with the, with the best quality people that we can find. Um, allow them to grow, give them opportunity, and ultimately, um, you know, that will then further, you know, add to the opportunities within the region as well. So our relationship with um, the University of Waikato and the quality of people that have come through that is fantastic as well. So we, you know, we think this is a great place to do business, and we, we look forward to sharing our journey with our shareholders. Um, being a good corporate citizen, operating to the very highest levels of governance, sustainability, and social, um, you know, standards, and that's that's what we intend to do. And as we travel through our journey and we do these um, roadshows in the future, um, you know, I'll need to be accountable to everything I'm saying, and so I encourage people to call us out if they don't see us living up to those standards. And so, um, so thank you very much, and um, yeah, we're happy to answer a few questions. Yeah, nice.